Good morning. My name is Jeff Shaw um, from Hennepin County. And initially, I was contacted by Andrea and Colleen to pull together a logistics training. And I'm still struggling with logistics training. Um, hopefully, I can show you what Hennepin County does, some of the tools that we've used, that we've developed, and guide you in a direction uh, that can help you with your jurisdictions on one side and show you that it's a complicated labor intensive undertaking to to ensure that you have the capacity to respond during an emergency or during a short period of time uh, logistically with the right resources the right people and the right equipment so what are the challenges within each of your jurisdictions that you're facing regarding logistics are there any that come to mind I know this is early to think about this stuff. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Come on. Transportation. Transportation, OK. People, money, supplies. Where are they? Where do they need to go? How to get them there? What do you need? Where are you going to get them if you run out? So hopefully, we can bring some of this to light. Learning objectives, and I apologize, my PowerPoint, I'm notorious for waking up early in the morning and thinking, oh, I should put that in the PowerPoint. And so uh, even this morning, I was revising this thing. So I apologize to Colleen and Andrea for this. Um, understand the basic concepts and critical tasks of medical supply management and distribution. Uh, everyone's familiar with the public health preparedness and response capabilities. These are under the, or the medical supply management and distribution capability. Uh, understand the purpose and function of MSMD. Understand the functions of a local distribution node to facilitate effective medical supply management and distribution. And understand the tools available to support supply management and logistic functions. This isn't rocket science. However, there is no tool that you can apply universally for each jurisdiction is just a lot of hard work. It's a lot of training. It's a lot of staff identification, uh, setting the right skill sets with the um, positions. Uh, we're struggling in Hennepin County. We have a staff of roughly about 4,000 people, and we're still trying to fill positions. Because it's not only who can we put in this position, it's knowing what skill sets they have. And there's not a database within our county that shows that. So all of these things that I'm discussing and probably similar to what you're facing, uh, we're facing here in Hennepin County. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that at some of, you, some of your smaller jurisdictions that you're facing sh staff shortages, we are as well. We're, we have a population of over a million people and we've got basically three staff to do all of the planning for that, for those one million. So medical supply management and distribution. The definition, capability to procure and maintain medical materials prior to an incident and transport, distribute, and track these materials during an incident. The outcome is critical medical supplies and equipment are appropriately secured, managed, distributed, and restocked. How do we ensure that we are prepared to complete critical logistics and maintain the capacity to respond? Identify supplies. It's what do we have, what do we need, where we're going to get them, and how we're going to get them there. Identify staff and resources. Training, 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 training. I cannot emphasize that enough. Training, exercise. Because you can't respond within a short amount of time without knowledgeable staff. Identify storage and distribution locations. Where are you keeping the stuff? And where is it going? And once it gets there, what are you going to do with it? And then assess plans based on the CDC's public health preparedness and response capabilities. This is critical. Are you all familiar with the capabilities? Yes? No? OK. Within each of these capabilities, there are measurements. And I really suggest you apply those to your, to your plans. They will help you. Identify your resources, train and exercise. That's how you're going to get to where you want to be. There is no, I talked about this, there is no singular approach to 
medical supply management and distribution. In Hennepin County, we, our supplies are managed now by a county contractor. We have um, a contractor called Alexander's Mobility. They're basically a logistics company. Uh, and we have given all of our emergency preparedness supplies to them. They store them, manage, maintain. They have an online inventory system for us to use. And they'll drop those on site where we need them within two hours of the notification to do so. So we call them up, they get them on the truck, and they'll drop them within two hours at all of our eight sites. We have eight pods in Hennepin County. So we actually have a very different way of doing this compared to what Art does in Ramsey County. And if you talk about what you do, Art, we farm our stuff out. Art goes out and buys a lot of stuff so he can, <laughs> for, for fortunately, he, so he can manage his stuff. Do you want to talk about the, how you manage your equipment? How I do it. Actually, I have a very different approach than with Jeff, where Jeff makes a phone call. My, my system is a little bit different. I have three trailers that are fully loaded with supplies, and this just happens to be uh, w inside one of the trailers. I have a pod box, which is used for clinics with vaccines or vaccinations. So I can pull this out, and it has everything I need to run a clinic for the first 24 hours on a vaccination site. Each site also has two of these metal cages, and there's eight boxes that are filled with various supplies. And I happen to have one li a list of my supplies in the trailers. Each of these trailers hold three mass dispensing site go kits, as I call them. And there's enough supplies in there for a 24-hour operation. On these, we're required to have eight mass dispensing sites open up at the same time. So I have three trailers that have all eight of the uh, mass dispensing site uh, supplies in it, and they're all parked at our public works. We have an agreement with public works that they'll take these trailers and they'll deliver them out to the various sites and then unload them. After the 24-hour period, we go into our 48-hour period. In 48-hour period, in our Plato building, I have a supply room that has enough supplies for all eight of our mass dispensing sites there for another 24 hours. The final leg of it is our 72-hour mark, and then I have vendors that I have 24-hour contact with, and what I do do with that at my 48 hour, I'll contact the vendors such as Granger and I'll say, I'll need these supplies. Granger has been very, very helpful and I have an online account and they have a list of all the supplies I need. They've done it free of charge. So all I have to do or my facilities manager is go in there, place the order, and then in 12 hours, the stuff is delivered to Plato and then it goes out. As far as transportation goes, we have routes. The CDC has uh, a program called Tour Solver, and what it does, it plats out routes. So when we go from like our LDM, where it's up in public works, the routes that the public works people take will bring us all the way around to each site so they know the routes, and it works fairly well. To manage all the inventory, I use uh, Asset Tracks Inventory Management System that's we purchased. It's all barcoded. And when we start issuing out these, all the supplies, each of our staff members have a barcoded ID card. So when they enter the site, we scan them. They're scanned in. And then when they take out supplies, we scan them and asset track tracks everything. And it's all connected to our county servers, which we have access to anywhere we go within the county. And we can order, we can see what sites are doing what. If they get down to below the 25% level, we can reorder stuff without the sites telling us. That's it in a nutshell. 
And we do things very differently in Hennepin County. We don't have a high-speed asset tracks inventory management system. We have a system that we downloaded from uh, Inflow, and you can go online and take a look at it and download a copy of it, and you can play around with it within your jur jurisdiction. Um, just Google uh, Inflow and you'll find it. Uh, it's, it was initially built for private business, but it works for the county. Uh, it, tracks, it tracks the product, it tracks the, the product code, expiration dates, movement. Uh, it's a pretty robust system for the price of it. So um, we use that in coordination with Alexander Mobility's online inventory management system. So this farming it out, giving it to a contractor is working well for us. Um, having the ability for them to maintain it, it's all climate controlled, relieves us from having to purchase trailers and then put trailers somewhere where all of our supplies won't mold or um, something else bad happens. So um, the liability rests with them, which some of our administrators like. Um, so four of the things that we're going to go over is preparedness tasks, preparedness measures, performance tasks, and activity activation tasks. And what I said about the public health capabilities is if you can fulfill those capabilities within your plans, you can increase your response efficiency. So the, the task, develop plans. Uh, how many of you have plans for moving your medical supplies? Specific plans? About half of you? Well, from the RDN, and then once they enter your jurisdiction, what are you going to do with them? And those, those plans should, um, should describe the staff that are going to move them, how they're going to be managed, the, uh, the tracking of those, uh, of, of those equipment, um, and the, how to maintain inventory from point A to point B, and then also how is it, uh, when it's expensive when it's expended, excuse me. Uh, est establish strategies for transporting materials through restricted areas, law enforcement checkpoints, and critical locations. Um, this may, may not be as critical in your jurisdictions as it is in uh, the metro, uh, but this is very important because if you need to get something from point A to point B where point B is restricted, we need to have agreements with local law enforcement on how to breach those checkpoints if they're active. Um, preparedness measures. Plans developed and approved. You can write plans all day long, but if you don't share them with your partners locally, they're not plans. They're going to fail. And this is something that we're working on in Hennepin County. We have uh, our local jurisdictions that house our pods. Um, we meet with them regularly. However, they do not have a good understanding of our department emergency response plan uh, and how they function as a part of that. They just know that they're supposed to secure that site once they're called. But what are the other intricacies that are going to be needed of law enforcement, uh, both at the sheriff's office and at the local jurisdiction in an event? So developed and approved means you can write your plans, but share them and have whoever's participating outside your jurisdiction sign off on that plan. Make sure that they understand it. Hazard specific plans identify and prioritize resource requirements. An anthrax, aerosolized anthrax event will not have the same resource requirements as a smallpox or influenza or uh, plague. Um, what are the, some of the, you know, just like the, the north side tornado. That's very different from all of our other public health emergency response plans. So right now we're, we're writing mass care plans, family assistance center, family assistance center plans, shelter plans, uh, community recovery plans. We're starting to move towards a broader scope rather than just anthrax and bioterrorism plans. So if you follow the national response framework, You'll have your functional annexes and you can have your incident specific annexes. And this is where it pulls all of the capabilities from the functional annexes in to prioritize them for each specific event. Uh, plans implemented for procurement and maintenance of inventories. So this is what do you have, 
Where is it? And if you need more, who are you going to get it from? And that's, that's one of the critical things. And this is a good example of two weeks ago, I changed, in, I changed out the whole drive line in my truck. And so I pulled the rear axle and, you know, everything. And I pulled it out and I got, read the technical, you know, the technical manual and how to do it. And so I put everything back together. Truck's in my garage. I didn't have a brake fluid. I could go. I just couldn't stop. I didn't have brake fluid in my garage. And I didn't have a way to go get the brake fluid. So the brake fluid's at the auto parts store, but I'm just sitting in my garage and my wife wasn't home. So I had to wait till she got home to work or from work so I could actually drive my truck. So this is... You got to know what you have, what you need, and where to get it. Uh, locally available sources identified to provide additional resources. What do you have within your jurisdiction that can support your plans in a response outside of what you currently have? And this is critical. I mean, everything is critical, but I mean, this is more critical because you're going to run out of stuff, and you're going to need you're going to need staff who understand where to get this stuff and who to talk to at these facilities, like Granger. If, uh, if Art at Ramsey County rent runs out of something, Granger has it. He has briefed his staff on where to go, how to procure those supplies, and then how to direct Granger to get those supplies to where they're needed. Uh, activation tasks. Um, this is another, another high point. Established medical supply warehouse management structure. We have a local distribution node in our jurisdiction, and we have a pretty robust organizational structure uh, that we use. It's all HSPHD staff within the LDN. Uh, they have been extensively trained, and now that we've trained them, we've lost about half of them due to retirement or whatever, you know, movement. Uh, and so we continue to train them because this is one of those functions that in this sheet, you'll see on this column, the center building is our LDN, which supports all of our other operations. And MDH may be moving to the direct ship option, and so we won't be using this as, as much. However, it will be used for resupply. So if our staff and our LDN don't have the capacity to fulfill their positions, to do what they need to do, all of our other sites in this hub and spoke model fail. They won't fail, but they'll, they'll suffer. So make sure you have a trained and capable management structure. Uh, activate warehouse operations. So make sure you get your LDN up and ready or up and running and identify needed transportation assets. This was mentioned at the beginning. If you don't have county vehicles, Find someone who has vehicles and get an MOU or a contract with them. This is going to be uh, a, a failing point along with communication that always fails. It's responding within a short amount of time, getting stuff from A to B, and how you're going to get there, get it there. We in Hennepin County struggle with this. Believe it or not, we do not have Hennepin County vehicles that can transport supplies from A to B. They're all used by other departments unless we have a state of emergency and the county administrators say, flip the switch and say, do whatever you need to do. We don't have county vehicles available to HSBHD to move stuff. We've been working on this for three years and this is kind of why we went to Alexander Mobility because with them, we can call them and they'll drop the stuff within two hours. And not only do they have to go pick it up, they have it at their warehouse, so they can pull it off the rack, put it in the truck, and it'll be on site within two hours. So it's a pretty efficient process. It does not cost that much. Uh, it costs less than you think it would because uh, they're just storing it right now. So this is the processes and capabilities matrix. Anybody, has everybody seen this before? No? This is... This, this illustrates the dependence on the other capabilities within um, the CDC's, within the CDC's list. Over here, I'm sorry my arrows didn't point, didn't show up here, but there's arrows. Uh, activate medical supply management and distribution, establish security, supply management, receipt and distribution, then recovery. So here is 
think about this is your doc. This is the brains of the operation, planning, logistics, communication, um, safety, resource requests. And these are all the capabilities that are dependent on medical supply management and distribution. So you need a doc. You need on-site incident management. You need someone at the site to know this stuff is coming to me. What am I going to do with it? Public safety and security. If you've got an event that is going to require crowd control or security at perimeter security, they need to know that this stuff is coming in. Uh, within our LDN, we've got the sheriff's office, and we've developed a uh, pretty complex method of establishing security, whereas if they don't have, if the driver entering the facility, this is for, one of, for some of our closed pods, if they don't have driver's license numbers and license plates on file with the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, they don't access, they, they can't gain access to our facility the sheriff's office will turn them away. And they actually did it in an exercise because they, some of the documentation didn't match. Which is good because they're doing their job. Uh, critical resource logistics and distribution. This is all the stuff that's not medical. Um, wheelchairs, um, wheelchairs, tables, chairs, signs, other things that are not related to medical supply management distribution. Mass prophylaxis, resources provided, resource request, up to the doc. So all of this, it's all interrelated, and this just shows you that you can build a logistics plan, but if you don't have all these other capabilities in place, something's going to drop out. Communication. Communication's a big one within logistics. Um, Tactical communication, and this is something that I've been counting to struggle with. We just figured out we need about 15 more 800 megahertz radios at, what are they, 3,500 bucks a piece? Yeah, so um, everyone knows what an operation center is. Under the logistics section, um, logistics co coordinates human resources, supplies, and equipment and ensures the delivery of medical supplies. This is Hennepin County's organizational structure. This is just a, actually a fraction of it. Um, you can see we have a service and support branch that aligns with ICS principles. Um, we've got info and tech and communications under the service and pretty much everything else under support. And this does not actually represent all the work that we put into this because once you branch this thing out, it's enormous. Um, and this is where that training comes in, is you, getting your unit leaders to understand what is underneath uh, their command and control. Uh, this is our ops section. Logistics section coordinates, ops section directs. So here's our LDN org chart. Pretty complicated, but um, it, it it works. We've had two extra two full scale exercises so far, uh, and we've exceeded our expectations for what we can process through the facility. There's the ops plan. It includes just in time training and job aids, which we are now uh, revising all of our job aids to align with the Fed's position checklist because they're no longer job aids anymore. Here's our, an aerial view of our LDN. And this is something that if you got a plan, you need to put stuff like this in. It's because you can have the facility, but if I walk outside and I look at this building, it's like, I don't know the entrance, the access, the access points, uh, where staff parking is, where client flow. Um, areas are, and it's very helpful for, for staff to see something like this. I'm a very, very visual person, and the majority of my, or to say, our, our training steps are training boxes in a flowchart. They don't look like Word documents. 
it's a step one, this is what you do. Step two, this is what you do. And for the LDN, I've got basically a page like this that has boxes with arrows for each position. And this, so that it's not a job aid of, of sorts. And within the LDN, we post those position expectations of, for each position, we put them on the wall. So a quality control specialist within the LDN, what are they doing? What are they looking for? When supplies are picked, everything's put in a box, and it comes to the quality control specialist, what are they looking for in that box? It's not on here. It's up on the wall in case they forget. And this is, that's good when you have staff turnover or shift change. Uh, this is a basic floor plan. Uh, it's just warehouse operations, and you can see the curve there and the curve here. These are just, um, these are just supply racks. But it's, I mean, it's relatively simple of, of how we've set up. And this I included, this is something that I presented down in Atlanta. Um, it just shows you that with, with more detailed plans, you can increase the def increase the efficiency of your operations and de decrease the resource requirements. Uh, here you can see the projected site workforce reduction based on traditional pods and alternate methods. The devil is in the details and I hate to use cliches and things like that but you really need to get down to the to the details within your plans to make them work. And then train on them. Exercise on them. I can't, I cannot emphasize that enough. We, I'd say within the last three, four years, we, we've moved from the mentality of fulfilling grant requirements to we need to exercise to increase the capability and capacity of our plans, especially with things like the north side tornado. How are we going to support events like that? How are we going to support events like the bridge collapse? So I can't emphasize enough on get down into the details, train on the details, make sure your staff are familiar with the details of your plans. Um, it will help you. It will help you in that short time response. So here's just a blow up of that with the LDN. LDN serves our drive-through dispensing sites, our pod sites, and also our first responder distribution. Is anyone familiar with the FEMA task book? FEMA task books, I see a couple heads nodding. If you have not seen these, I'd recommend go to the site, and here's a link to it. It's just, it's all right. It's funny, um, but if you just if you just search for FEMA task books, it'll pull you up to FEMA's website like this, and it has all of these positions with their job aids, and you can take these, um, and you can. Um, play around with them and make them applicable to your jurisdiction. I mean, has, they, they have a lot of things in here that I think that I've, people have been searching for for years, and this thing's been around since 08. You know, not a whole lot of people know about this stuff. Is that what you use when you put your down? Well, they're, yeah, they're considered a checklist now. But this is, a, we're, we're, we're trying to align our operations more with, uh, with FEMA. Um, using the ICS forms that are federally used, not ones that we've tailored locally. Um, we want to use ICS forms that are familiar to everyone. Um, position checklists, we want to use position checklists that are familiar with everyone, nationally recognized position checklists, not um, I'm sorry for the metro region, but not ones that have been developed by the mass dispensing work group. Ones that have, a that have been developed federally. 
So some of these things that you know they don't, you know, building manager, base cap manager, but there are other. This is a it's a pretty long list. There are other positions that directly apply to public health. And here you have the job aid, and you've got an assessment tool on this side. You can the the job aid is the individual employee responsibility. Is that helps the person do the job. The supervisor, that's where the measurement tool comes in. Is they can say how well did that person do their job based on the job aid that they were that they were provided. So I mean it's 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 pretty effective that FEMA put this out and said this is what this person's supposed to do and here's a tool for the supervisor to say, hey, did they do their job? If they didn't do their job, we'll throw it in the AAR and we'll learn about it, change our plans, how we do things, and we'll um, have a better response structure for the next event. So this is a lot, I think a lot of, I'm running late on time here, but uh, a lot of our improvement planning activities get lost because we're so busy with other things, including us in Hennepin County. We have exercises, we write these lengthy AARs with these giant improvement planning matrix or matrices and we need to get stuffed in a network file and how often are they recovered and actually tracked? Unless they're in the CAP system and someone's sending you an email and saying, you need to do this, you need to do this. So um, it's, it's important to have your supervisor evaluate the job aid or the job performance, throw that in the AR, and then make sure you're tracking the improvement planning activities to modify your plans to obviously increase your capability. So here is what we have done is we've taken um, the task book and revised it for our supply unit leader position. And each of the job aids has scope of work, organizational structure, who they report to, who's, who they're super supervising, um, basic command tasks for lead leadership positions if, if they are in a unit leader, uh, and then role-specific tasks, immediate, intermediate, and ongoing. Does this look familiar to what your current job aids are? Okay. The intermediate, immediate, and ongoing, that's helpful. Immediately, what do you need to do when you get on site? Check in with your supervisor, grab your equipment, your radio, um, your vest, identification information. Look at your job aid. Look at your area of operation. What do you need? What supplies do you need? If you're a inventory management specialist, you need your computer. You need your software. You probably need to get in touch with IT support and make sure that if your system goes down, you have a redundant system or a paper backup copy. So this, that immediate and intermediate and ongoing steps, that's very helpful to someone who just steps in the position. And maybe someone's coming in as a shift change, they're going to want to pick up at intermediate and ongoing. Any questions before I run the video? I must have done a really good job then. <laughs> that or confuse you all. Can we run the video? Welcome to the Alameda County Pod Training Module for the Logistics section. As a member of the logistics team at a point of dispensing site, you have an important role in making the pod successful. Nothing happens in the pod without logistics getting there first. The logistics team is made up of two primary subgroups, supply and services. Since many logistics functions must be carried out simultaneously, the logistics section chief will need to delegate a good deal of authority. The supply group is tasked with keeping the rest of the pod sections working by staying ahead of them with material supplies. The services group 
has roughly the same task as it applies to people and services. Both groups are essential in every area of the pod to set up and staff physical workstations and keep them functioning. The logistics supply group has three basic units, general supplies, pharmaceutical supplies, and runners who transport the supplies. Pharmaceutical supplies require special treatment. Medications need to be tracked closely to comply with pharmacy laws and practices. Many of them also require refrigeration or temperature control. And of course, in an emergency, medications become even more valuable and require a certain amount of security. Since the pod revolves around dispensing medication, managing pharmaceutical supplies is a critical responsibility. The pod can continue to fulfill its mission if it temporarily runs low on any other supply, but not medication. The general supplies group is in charge of all other materials that make the pod work. They must receive, store, and stage a wide variety of supplies. Experts in inventory management are good people to have in the supplies group. The runners, of course, have the responsibility of safely getting the supplies from the staging area to the pod units. The other group in logistics is the services group, providing support in four areas, personnel, communications and IT, food service, and maintenance. The logistics personnel unit handles all staffing needs in coordination with planning. This may include checking staff in and out. As staff arrives, they'll be asked to complete a volunteer registration form. Based on their skills and credentials, the personnel unit leader will assign staff their positions. Once people are assigned, they're given a vest, name tag, and job action sheet. The personnel unit also handles training and ensures completion of paperwork such as the disaster service worker documentation. Future shift staffing needs and demobilization should be coordinated with both planning and command. The communications and IT unit has the responsibility of setting up and making sure that pod communications and computer equipment are in place and functioning. This probably means a lot of batteries and recharging as well as hardware, software, and connection troubleshooting. Communication is essential and not always easy to maintain. Fortunately, there are many communication options typically available and the communications unit should make sure they always have a plan B. And unlike expendable supplies that make up much of the supply team's inventory, communications equipment needs to be signed out and returned. The food service unit has responsibility for the nutritional needs of the staff. Food and water breaks must be coordinated with the city EOC, American Red Cross, or other agencies contracted to provide food and beverages. The maintenance unit takes care of facility maintenance and housekeeping, and depending on the length of the emergency, may be one of the most important services. Like all other units, Logistics needs to keep an ICS Form 214 unit log. ICS Message Form 213 will also become particularly familiar because that's how other units will communicate their requests, most of which will probably come to Logistics. Logistics will also need to maintain inventories and receipts. Just as planning and operations go together, Finance is the record-keeping side of logistics. All inventory lists and receipts will need to be passed to the finance section. In addition to the obvious areas covered by supplies and services, the logistics section is also responsible for first aid. First aid kits fall under the supply group, while first aid providers fall under the services group. Ambulances or other transports from the pod to clinics, hospitals, or other treatment sites are logistics responsibilities. Depending on the need, the logistics team might need to appoint a transport officer to oversee this. Pod security will be provided by law enforcement, 
who will coordinate directly with pod command staff. If an ICS emergency required supplementing the police with private security, acquiring security guards would fall under the logistics services group. When the demobilization order comes to close down the pod, logistics will supervise the breakdown and repacking of all equipment and supplies. Logistics is then in charge of transporting and returning all equipment and supplies to their original readiness. And before the doors are closed, it's the logistics team who ensures that the facility is cleaned and returned to pre-event conditions. From the moment the decision is made to start a pod until the facility is returned to its pre-event status, the logistics team is working. The pod depends on you, and your continued good humor, as well as service, impacts everyone. Thanks for your extra effort. This pod video training series is brought to you by the Alameda County Public Health Department Office of Public Health Emergency Preparedness, in collaboration with Applied Creative Training, Inc. So, what that did for me when I first saw that is there's, there's things in here that you just don't think about. Runners. Runners under the logistics section at the site. You know, we all think about, okay, we're going to drop the, su the supplies within the logistics section with this in the supply unit. When everyone's running like crazy, we have ushers. We have ushers to help direct people, but we don't have runners on staff to get the supplies from the supply unit out to the dispensing um, areas or the dispensing stations. And that was like one of those moments to me, like we need, we need more people. So hopefully this helped jog a few things in your, in your head about things that you may need within um, to expand or enhance your current logistics plans. But uh, you see it's available on YouTube if you want to share it with your staff. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a good thing to see. So are there any questions from my section? Okay, thank you.